Thank you. Please bow with me. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thank you for your wonderful creation. We just thank you that you have reconciled us through the redemptive work and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us see you more clearly this morning, more brightly through the rightly dividing of your word. Guard me from error. Guard me from subtracting any truth from your word or anything, adding anything that's, that's false. Um, keep us from distractions this morning. Keep us from the desires to check our cell phones and, and text messages and help us really see you more brightly, more clearly clearly through your holy word. And this I ask in your son's precious, holy, wonderful, and saving name. Amen. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to have a, a, a morning with you, or at least the next hour and 45 minutes, talking about uh, some interesting things here. I cannot remember a time in my life that I was not interested in the eye, physically, uh, the, the ability of the eye to see. I was always, I remember as a child being very fearful of blindness myself when I first learned about blindness. Uh, so I've always had a special interest. Um, it really grew substantially in the eighth grade when I dissected a cow's eye in front of the class. When I saw how impressed the girls were, I really got interested in the eye after that. So that's a confession. Um, but uh, there, was a, there was most of my life I was not very interested in the spiritual aspects of either blindness or physical healing of blindness and the kind of connecting the dots as to how I got here. Um, I, uh, I opened the Bible in uh, the year 2000. Uh, I was uh, joined a men's Bible study in September 2001. I was saved at the tender age of 45. Uh, so I was saved on October 3rd, 2001, baptized a year later, joined a church, and I'm still a member of that church. And just sort of further connecting the dots, Baxter McClendon has... Um, has heard my interest in the Bible as it re relates to my career in ophthalmology, looking at blindness. And uh, so he contacted this group, and that resulted in an invitation to join you this morning. We have kind of a Berean goal. You may remember in, in the book of Acts that uh, Paul and Silas uh, fled Athens to Berea, where they were, they were considered more noble. Not, I don't mean like better than, but just they're more noble in that they examined the scriptures daily. They poured over the scriptures daily. And that's the goal that I have for us today. Or as a third grade girl said to me one time when I quizzed her and I said, how important is it to read and study the Bible? She was raised in a family of a Christian physician. And she said, well, if you go through the day, if you go through the entire day and you don't read the Bible, then it means that everything else you did that day was more important to you than reading God's word. So that was pretty impactful, and I think that that's the goal that we have today as we, as we do this. So what is so special about the eye and eyesight? Somewhat a rhetorical question for ophthalmologists, but we're going to look at this from the standpoint of both an ophthalmology and somewhat theological concern. As Darwin, Charles Darwin, was looking very hard to try to rule out God in his life, came up with a theory that he, even at his death, had more doubt than most people have today in accepting it, but he had tremendous problems with the eye. This is an exact quote from his, from his thesis, to suppose that the eye, with all of its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to the different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, confess absurd to the highest degree. Darwin had tremendous problems with the eye. He had problems with the size of the pupil being so, pu so perfect in many different species, including the eye, in that if it were any smaller, it would be more limited by diffraction. If it were larger, it would be somewhat limited by aberration. So the fact that it was so perfectly and tightly balanced in that range was a great bother. What also really bothered him was the change in the refractive error of a newborn child to a growing child. The fact that everything in the eye was changing in concert. As the eye was getting longer, it wasn't becoming a minus 30 diopter axial myope, but there were other changes going on simultaneously. For that to have developed through a selection process did not make sense to him, and, uh, and uh, uh, this, this was a great, great problem to him. I've gone through a lot of different works. I've, I've got uh, uh, 
Uh, this is a, a book uh, here by Rabbi Harold Kushner, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, where he had a child that died. And he said to himself, well, God cannot be either all good and, and, and also all powerful, or this would not have happened to his child. So he went through a, a, a various uh, amount of, of struggle with this and ultimately concluded, yes, God is perfectly good, but he's not perfectly powerful because he didn't stop that from happening. I disagree with him. And so, um, and then Wayne Grudem has looked at the different gifts. My favorite author of all time, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a physician who left his profession as a physician, even taking care of royalty, to becoming a full-time preacher, preaching to 3,000 people, even at a without without much of a, without a microphone on a Friday night. Uh, think about getting 3,000 people now in England at a Bible study at, on a Friday night. John Piper and some others, and this is where I've gotten some of my some of my uh, my material. And really, I, I'm not so much of a dispensationalist, but for those that are, there's of course the atheistic view that the things we're talking about really don't matter. We just either don't have enough ex, uh, enough knowledge to explain it, or they didn't happen. They were charlatanisms, or they're just myths and things like that. I went to a Richard Dawkins atheist rally, and that's pretty much how they excused all of this. I thought, I thought it would be a, a right mission field, and it was. Um, but the four theistic views of, um, of miraculous gifts today are really the, you know, the strict cessationists. This is the, this is the, you know, in the pre-canonized era, before they had the Bible, these miracles were the signs and wonders that pointed and gave authority. And to have them happen today would be somewhat analogous to adding scripture and adding new things. So these people subscribe to the kind of the strict cessationists. Then there's those that are open but cautious. That is, yes, we do see miracles today. We don't want to subtract or take away from God's ability to heal. We see this, but we are somewhat cautious and we don't want to make that a spectacle, something that is, um, is, is, is giving Oh, more authority to the person doing it than the power of God. Then there's this, this group down here. It's, it's sort of the extreme end is the charismatic Pentecostal group. They've gotten somewhat of a, uh, 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 because of just kind of certain branding issues, uh, a, a new group has come up with, this, which is third wave, that, you know, this is wave one, wave two, and now third wave. And this is, well, yes, all these miracles are available today. They are just as powerful today. We've got to be a little bit more cautious. If, if, you're, if you're in this group, um, they tend to kind of emphasize the differences between themselves and this. But if you're not in this group, it, you can see a lot of similarity, kind of like if you were... You know, if, if you were, you know, I, I guess a, a modern thing you see would be the term, you know, liberal no, being called progressive, things like that. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a slight difference. I won't get into a lot of this because this could, this can start to certainly divide a lot of people. But again, I want to be like the Bereans. I want to go back to scripture. I want to dive into scripture and look at this much more thoroughly. And what, and when we talk about scripture, what was Jesus's view of the Bible? Well, we see in all four gospels, Jesus would rather die then disobey scripture. We taught that he fulfilled scripture. 400 Old Testament prophecies he fulfilled and 61 specific examples that he taught in himself that he was fulfilling that, that prophecy. Christ taught the unbreakable authority and permanence of scripture. Not one jot, tittle, one iota will pass from the law. So this is, this is, this is the unbreakable authority of scripture. He lives sin sinlessly. I always please my father, moment by moment, all by scripture. Staked his life on even obscure details of scripture. The son of man, yes, it's a title he loved using. It's, it, 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 it exemplifies his humanness, but it also was a dagger in the hearts of unbelieving Jews that kept seeing this in reference to Daniel 7. It's an obscure scripture, but even the Jews today would have trouble with this because of this reference, one like a son of man coming from the clouds. And Isaiah 53, these are, these are, these are, these are scriptures that, that, that just have Christ leaping off the, off the page. Christ proved his deity by a single word of scripture. In the Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah said to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool uh, for, uh, for thy feet. Christ proved the resurrection by a single verb tense in, in scripture. 
the I am statements. This is, this is the, this is the uh, same usage of the ancient Greek word ego ami that was used in precisely the same way that God spoke to Moses when Moses said, what if they ask your name? Who do I tell them that you are? I, I am that I am. This was Christ using exactly that verbiage seven times in John that caused them to want to kill him. So this, and they had no mistake seeing that this, they called this blasphemy. And, we'll, and we're gonna cover that to an even greater, greater degree. Um, Christ instilled passion in his disciples on the road to Emmaus uh, with scripture in the hearts of his disciples. Christ taught what scripture says God says. And Christ was condemned because of one quotation of scripture. And this is when the high priest stood up. Don't ever let anybody say Christ never said he was the son of God. He was the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice. And the high priest stood up in the midst of and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is that uh, that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. Again, ego ami. And you will see the son of man. Again, back to Daniel 7. This is all tying back. These are not simple words. These are, these are, these are daggers in the hearts of unbelievers seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. He's using exactly the same reference that Daniel used. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So this is, this is how this all came about. Now, we're not going to talk a lot about spiritual blindness, because that would take all morning, because we can see that the that scripture is replete with these types of references. What do you, uh, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye, Matthew 7? And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So. So we can see spiritual blindness, but we're going to talk mostly today as ophthalmologists and ophthalmologists in training about phys the uh, physical blindness. In this case, it's an example as a curse. In Genesis 19.1, when the two angels were in Lot's house and the, and the depraved men were trying to get in to have relations with them, and they, and they uh, struck with blindness, the, the angel struck with blindness, the men who were at the entrance of the house both small and great, so they wore themselves out groping for, the do groping for the door. So this was a curse, but it was also a blessing to think of what those angels really could have done. Could have very quickly, very easily, instantaneously annihilated them. So that's as a curse. And he said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, O Lord, Please open his eyes that he may see. So his colleagues could see after the Lord opened his eyes that, uh, and saw and behold, the, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So he gave them both this spiritual supervision, being able to see things they couldn't normally see. And then in contrast to that, and when the Syrians came down against them, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, please strike this people with blindness. So they got a supervision. And then these people got a blindness, so he struck with, with them the blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elijah. So again, a curse, but also a blessing, because they would have all been annihilated. And then this is, a, this is another example. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, this is the Apostle Paul, before he became the Apostle Paul, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, where he was brought to Ananias' house, where for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. And so he was without sight. This sight was restored. There are no examples, though, after the Gospels of restoration of blindness to sight. This is the closest thing to it, but it's not on the scale of the blind people that are healed by Jesus, as we'll see. And we'll also see that was a miracle exclusive to Jesus. He, Jesus was the only one that did that. And, in, and Saul, remembering that he was struck with blindness later on in Acts, and now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. This is Paul speaking. 
and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by hand. This was a curse by Paul, remembering this is what had happened to him previously. Previously. And then Paul's thorn in the flesh. We see that that's in 2 Corinthians. We don't know what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, and I think that's by design. Because I think that if, if we, for example, have uh, had, say, a different thorn in the flesh, we might dismiss it. We may dismiss that association. But there is great speculation that the thorn in the flesh is, in fact, blindness or eyesight related. And, and, and why did he have a thorn in the flesh? You know, was it in response to the way he treated the church earlier? No, it was in response to what had happened 14 years earlier. It's a strange, it's a strange chapter in 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, where he talks about, you know, he could go on boasting. And he talks about that because he's really in contrast to these false apostles, these Judaizers that come in with false teaching, trying to teach that, uh, that they have now special revelation, special revelation that causes the, them to tell the Jews that they need to go back into the law. Yes, they could keep Jesus, but they need to go back in with circumcision and all these other things, essentially saying that Christianity really needs to be a denomination within Judaism rather than uh, a, a, a separate belief system. And so Paul, in contrast, says, well, I'm really somebody who could boast, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. I could boast because 14 years earlier, uh, he was, he was, he was uh, given, he was brought into paradise, what he calls the third heaven, okay? Not bird atmospheric or first heaven, not planet, stars, sun, or second heaven, but God heaven, third heaven or paradise. And he saw things that he couldn't even understand, and even the things he could understand, he wasn't even allowed to speak about. So he had genuine revelation that he talks about. But because of that revelation being surpassing and so incredible, God recognized in him this desire to boast about it, a pride. Who wouldn't have pride after that? So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of this 14-year-ago revelation, a thorn was given me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Somewhat reminiscent of Job, where, a, where the, uh, Satan got permission from God to go harass Job initially with his possessions and family and then with his body. Here, this is a similar process where a ministering angel of Satan, a demon spirit, has been, has been given permission to go harass Paul. And so what is this? Well, if you look at Galatians 4.13, one of the first, either the first or second book that Paul has, has, uh, has written, you see that you know that it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. 4.15, for I testified to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. So there may have been something about his eyes that would have that makes you think that this was a problem. And then also to make sure that they knew he was the genuine author of the things they were receiving, he wanted to make sure they saw that what he was writing. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Maybe again a reference to his eyesight that he had to write with, with large letters. And very importantly in Act, Acts, and Paul said, I do not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So he struck the high priest, and they were shocked. But when you think about Paul's his history, his Jewish pedigree, how he was, how he really should have recognized the, the the attire and the position of the high priest, he would not have struck him. And so this coming to a as a surprise suggests that eyesight was a problem. And then here, blindness as a prelude to something usually bad. Genesis 20, uh, 27, when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, he answered, here I am. It was really Jacob that was tricking him and coming in. Remember, they had the promise. Rebekah had the promise. There are two nations inside of you, and the younger shall serve the older. So they knew that it was God's will that the younger Jacob would, would be over Esau, but they took matters in their own hand, somewhat like 
someone like, like uh, Abraham and Sarah when they waited and waited and didn't have the, their sons, so they took matters in their own hand uh, with the maidservant and had a, had, a, had a child. So this, they took matters in their own hand, and because of this, there were great consequences long term. In the book of 1 Samuel, Eli the priest, someone who was becoming spiritually somewhat deadened, certainly deadened to his son's activities that were going on with the sacrifices in the temple, taking the sacrifices improperly, having improper uh, relationships with people in the temple, those things. And Eli was becoming spiritually dim, but in parallel, his eyesight had become to grow dim so they could not see, he was lying down in his own place. This is also seen when Samuel was, uh, uh, Samuel was called three times before Eli recognized that this was the call of the Lord, go answer him, as opposed to uh, something else. And Jeroboam's wife did so. She rose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. You may remember that as the 12 tribes broke apart and the northern 10 tribes went to Israel, and then the southern two tribes of Judah were separated. The, the northern ten tribes were ruled by Jeroboam, and the southern two tribes by Solomon's uh, offspring, Rehoboam. And Jeroboam was concerned that the, that the inhabitants were going at Passover to cross over to the southern kingdom, and they would end up staying there. To avoid that from happening, he set up false idol areas of worship, and this was his punishment from death, uh, punishment uh, with death. And so Jeroboam's wife was given this message by Ahijah that uh, when you get back, Jeroboam is going to die, and he did. So it's kind of a prelude to something that's going to be bad. Now, the miracle of sight restoration in the Old Testament, no evidence. Isn't it interesting of all these miracles that occur, we get to talk as eye doctors about our profession, and there's, there is never a, a case of sight restoration in the Old Testament. After the Gospels, none. The closest thing was the Apostle Paul. And, and even to this day, you know, we haven't seen anybody born completely blind. I took care of a, a girl that came from, the, the, um, uh, from uh, uh, near Chernobyl. She was, she was born near where the Chernobyl accident was. And she had uh, uh, anophthalmia and, and, and uh, uh, essentially only half of an eye. And we were able to get, uh, get her back to kind of a 20,200 type uh, vision with sclerocornea. We treated that with a transplant. She was actually able to play miniature golf and things like that. But you, there's no evidence of a perfect restoration of eyesight. In Jesus' ministry, though, and as an eye doctor, this is really neat because restoration of sight was his most commonly reported category of miracles. And I think this is because of reference back to the Old Testament. Again, we see these things in the New Testament that we need to link to the Old Testament. It's one book. Don't think for a second you've got a God of the Old Testament, of judgment, and a God of grace of the New Testament. Same God, all 66 books, same God. And here in Exodus 4, 10, then the Lord sent to him, or this was, this was uh, Moses trying to get out of being the speaker. And the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So who makes sight? Who makes blindness? God is still sovereign over that. And then in, in, in reference, uh, Psalm 146, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, and the Lord loves the righteous. So the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. This is a prophetic reference that the man born blind is holding on to. In Luke 4, this is Jesus beginning his Galilean ministry in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and fulfill Old Testament prophecy by recovering the sight of the blind, something that hadn't been done before, to set at liberty those that are oppressed. So again, he's going to fulfill this prophecy. In Isaiah alone, there are three prophetic references. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. Again, no episodes of this in the Old Testament. It's now going to happen under Jesus' ministry. Isaiah 35, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison 
those uh, prison those who sit in darkness. So specific episodes of Jesus healing blindness. This is where we're going to get in these specific episodes of Jesus healing blindness. This is in Galilee, not Jericho. This is to distinguish this from Bartimaeus. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. Well, why are they calling him son of David? Well, because they know that this, this has never been happened. But they are looking, as all the Jews are looking for, the Messiah. They know that in the Old Testament, when the Messiah comes, that is the answer to their blindness. So they're using, again, this messianic title, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. Again, this is really more for the timetable he's trying to create. He's got a lot more work to do before he wants the, the opposition to build against him. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. Matthew 12, 22, different episode. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him. How he was brought to him, we don't know. And he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, and they didn't say, is this a miracle worker? No. Can this be the son of David? Again, knowing Old Testament prophecy, is this the Messiah that they're looking for? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. And you're going to see that, that, that just like the parables, the miracles are a divider. They bring a, a, one group closer and another group further away. One group gr comes toward Jesus, the other group hardens their heart. Now, Bartimaeus mentioned three different places in Scripture. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with the disciples, a great, a great crowd, and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, bar, bar, son of, that's what that bar means, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Very common for blind beggars to be sitting on by the roadside because they were begging. They, they needed to be by traffic. And, um, and so, um, uh, and, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, again, messianic title, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. Why do you think they rebuked him? Doesn't that sound kind of sensitive? Well, interestingly, Jericho is 15 miles east of, of Jerusalem, but it's about two-thirds, three-quarters of a mile lower. So you could have very pleasant climate. This is maybe in that part of the world, kind of the, their San Diego. You could have kind of a, a, a very mild climate compared to Jerusalem that could have snow on the ground. So if you're blind and you're a beggar and you don't have a place to stay, you're going to seek that. Additionally, there was a bush that grew there, much like Laodicea, the church in, in, in Revelation, that, that, that was wealthy but lukewarm. That, that They both had these, these eye ointments that were good for people that had poor eyesight. So it, there's, it's been theorized that there are a, a disproportionate number of blind people in Jericho, and maybe... That's why there was somewhat this insensitivity, because they see this all the time. It wasn't, it wasn't a special case. I know that if, you know, when years ago when I you know, saw for the very first time somebody standing on the, on, the, on the street corner, you know, homeless, give me food and all that, you know, I, I had a different feeling than when I see this, this now on every street corner. And, and that's probably not, it's, it's probably not the way Jesus would look at it. But, I, but it is, if you get, you get a little bit numb to that, and that may be, what is going on here? Uh, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more. Messianic title, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind men, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, you're a blind man, and one of your most important possessions is your cloak. It's your warmth by day, and it's how you collect money by morning. You put it, you, you put it out in front of you, and people put money on it. And so he threw it off because he knew he's going to come back and get it. He sprang up and came to Jesus, and Jesus said to him, "What do you want me to what, want me to do for you?" And the blind man said, "Rabbi, let me recover my sight." And Jesus said to him, "Go your way; your faith has made you well." And immediately 
he restored his sight and followed him on the way. This, by the way, is one of the key titles or, or, or themes in the book of Mark. Immediately is a word that appears 35 times, more than the other three Gospels all put together. You'll see it in this account and the other Gospels, but, but when you read the book of Mark, you'll see that word. That's a, that's a theme in Mark. Now, Matthew, written by a Jew for a Jewish, Jewish audience, Matthew an answers the question, who is Jesus? Is he the Messiah? And so, so in behold, again, Bartimaeus, there were two blind men in this version sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that, that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called to them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And Jesus said, let, Lord, let our eyes be open. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and, and followed him. And then Luke, the beloved physician, often, often has even more uh, when it comes to medical things on there. Um, as he drew near Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Hearing the crowd going by, he inquired what, the, uh, what this meant. They said to him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out, all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped, commanded him to be brought, uh, brought to him. And when he came near, he asked, what, would, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well and immediately recovered your sight and followed him. So you can see in these three presentations, just slightly different views, filling out each, each other with key lessons that Jesus is not only recognized by these spiritually sighted individuals, but physically blind individuals as the Messiah, as the one that can fulfill Old Testament prophecy and restore eyesight, but it also shows Jesus' compassion, his ability to immediately uh, heal them. Now, when we come to Bethsaida, they, they came to Bethsaida and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man, it's, again, a separate issue, a separate incident here. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. And Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. What do we have here? We have the, the, we, the first enhancement procedure. Okay. We have, we have the first enhancement procedure here. He laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he, saw, and he saw everything clearly, and he sent him his way, saying, do not even enter the village. Well, going back to this, um, you know, Scott, uh, you know, have you ever done this with your patients? Have you spit, made mud, put it on the eyes? Is there a CPT code for that? I, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 haven't, tried, I haven't tried that. Um, but now, what do you think is really going on here? Do you think that maybe, oh, you know, Jesus had a rough day yesterday, he's tired today, he just maybe, just doesn't quite have it today. He needed two tries, okay? We've all had a bad day. Does Jesus ever have a bad day? I don't think so. What's going on here? Well, I think that, that, that it's okay to see a healing process in stages. We just saw three presentations of Bartimaeus healing, and his healing was done so immediately. What if today we pray for a healing for ourselves, a family member, a patient, a loved one, a not-so-loved one? What if we pray for somebody else's healing and all the examples were immediate healing in the Bible and we saw not immediate healing? We might conclude it's not God's will to heal. I think that God can heal in different stages. Sometimes we don't see an immediate and full healing at every stage. And I would say that most of the time we see that, uh, th that today. Truly I say to you, now this is, this, is, this is about John the Baptist. This is Jesus speaking about John the Baptist. And, and, and truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kept kingdom of heavens is greater than he. But he's talking about the greatness of John the Baptist. But then when he's, when, when he's imprisoned and he's about to be beheaded, 
and he's and he's and he's really in a weakened state, his faith starts to wonder if Jesus is really the one. And when the men came uh, had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has said us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Well, in that hour, he he healed many, uh, healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them in response to John the Baptist, Go tell John what you have seen and heard. The very first thing he mentions is that the blind receive their sight. So are you the one we're looking for? He could have said yes. He could have said absolutely. He could have given another answer. But again, what does Jesus do? He goes back to his specific fulfillment of Scripture. Those three different verses in Isaiah, the verse in Psalms, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So, so it's really neat to see that. When you get to the book of John, which we're going to do, you, um, you get these seven statements of who Jesus is. You get these seven signs that include the, the sight to the blind in chapter 9. It's almost like a crescendo of, of, of miracles that just sort of starting with wine to water all the way up to this crescendo. And then you've got these seven very important I am statements. These are the statements that led to his crucifixion because he is saying that he is one with God. He, he and his father are one. And so, again, you've got these, you know, the, the, uh, uh, water to wine, healing the nobleman's son, the paralyzed man, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing the blind man, raising of Lazarus. So seven, seven miracles. So, so Jesus is going to show who he is. But let's step back and see how he's able to do this. Well, Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. This is a misunderstood uh, section here, the firstborn over of all creation. Firstborn does not mean first creation, first created. He wasn't created. He's self-existent. This, this word is better substituted preeminence. He is preeminent over all creation. For by him, all things were created. Oh, wait a second. I thought God created everything. Yes, he did. By what vehicle, though? First member of the Holy Trinity used through the second member of the Holy Trinity, this is the vehicle of creation, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, speaking of Jesus, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, okay? Why do atoms have positive protons and positive protons that don't fly apart? Why do they have positive protons and electrons that just don't collide into each other, positive and negative force? Okay, we have books that are this thick on van der Waals forces, supernuclear forces, and things like that. When John says at the end of the Gospel of John, the earth could not hold all the miracles if they were written down, I believe this is what they're talking about. I believe it's a literal verse. I think that all the miracles that are being done right now, even if they were put on jump drives, I don't think the earth could hold all the jump drives of all the miracles that are being done right now. I look at this and I don't say, you know, what, was it six literal days? It may have been. Why did you take so long? Okay, why did you take so long? If it was six literal days that, 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 that you created everything. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and, th and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So that's, that's our Jesus Christ right there. That is absolutely remarkable. So when we see that, it becomes more relevant when we see that Jesus is passing by. As they passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. Okay, something we've seen in our practices, we've never seen. And the disciples asked him, teacher, rabbi, who sinned 
this man or his parents that he was born blind. Well, what are they, what are they assuming? That this blindness from birth must be a consequence of some sinful activity. There was even a, a, a theory of prenatal sin, that you could actually sin in the womb, but that there's also a, a, a thought that the parents could have sinned and that they could have been punished by this way. Well, where does that come from? Well, go back to Leviticus 21, 16 through 21, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron saying, none of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. So they weren't allowed. This is what this again trying to create the, a type of Christ. But for no one who has a blemish shall draw near a man blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long. I mean, it's very politically in this day and age incorrect. But this is setting up a uh, sacrificial system, or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand, or a hunchback, a dwarf. All these things that shall come near to offer bread of his God. Again setting up a sacrificial system. The thing I studied that, that, that drew me to, to, uh, to my saving faith. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. This is back in John 8, prior to chapter 9. But you have not known Him. Now this is going to be where He really starts to stoke the fire. Okay, He's talking to the Pharisees. He's telling them, it is my Father who glorifies me, my Father in heaven, of whom you say, he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say I do not know him, I would be a liar, like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, ego ami, always self-existent. Uh, use of that same word, same phrase that, G that God used in, in, uh, in, uh, in front of Moses. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus didn't run away. It appears that he blinded their eyes. He spiritually blinded their eyes, and he walked out, went out of the temple. So this is right before this. So he has really got them into a fervor. And so now, as he's got them into a fervor, right after that, he's really going he's gonna to really up the ante. As they passed by, they saw this blind man. And the disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned his man or his parents, that he was born blind. Well, Jesus tells them that it's really not an either or. It's what they call a tertium quid. There's a third possibility, and it's the third possibility that's really the right possibility. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works. Not I must work the works, but we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground, he made mud, with, with his saliva, then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. He said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. I'll come back to that. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Okay. Here we have the Sabbath. He just, he just created six violations of Sabbath law in spitting, making mud, anointing, going to walk, wash, and come back. Six violations. Okay, and this is, to, this is for the people that feel man was made for the Sabbath rather than Sabbath for, the, for man. And so he's really going to get their anger, their anger up. By the way, this, this is a special term here. Um, there's great symbolism here in that if you go back to John chapter 4, that um, you know, with the woman at the well, um, he, is, uh, he is sent by his father as the living water to that person. So that's where that word comes from. This is a word that is to remind them that this water is sent by God. If you want to know the history of this, it was a, um, it was a pool of very f refreshing water in the north part of the uh, walled city. 
It comes from the Gion Spring, which is five miles away. However, in that era, you could have a walled city, and, and, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, militarily, you could, uh, you could conquer that city by either preventing the water from getting in, or you could use the water as a way of getting into the city to conquer the city. So King Hezekiah decided to create a subterranean aqueduct. And so what he did was, he, he recognizing this, this wonderful water um, from the Gion Spring, Josephus called it sweet water, created this aqueduct that would course down uh, between the um, Kidron Valley and the walled city in underneath the, uh, underneath the, 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 the wall. And so this is, this is and they, they called it uh, Shiloham in the Old Testament, and they used, for the pool itself, they called it uh, scent because it reminded them it was sent from God. So this beggar went and washed and came back seeing. After six violations of, of, uh, of Jewish law, a violation of, of the Sabbath, the neighbors and those who'd seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? And some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went, I washed and received my sight. Now, now, how is this different from blind Bartimaeus? Blind Bartimaeus had spiritual sight before he had physical sight. Okay, so he's calling out messianic title, knowing you can heal me, Jesus, heal me. And this man doesn't know. He doesn't know yet. He, has, he doesn't have a spiritual understanding, but he's starting to maybe get some understanding. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They, they brought to the Pharisees the man who'd formerly been blind. Now it was a, a Sabbath day. It's, it's interesting that you'll see very clearly that not only is blindness the most common miracle that Jesus does, but a large percentage of his miracles. You don't have a, a distribution that places one-seventh of the miracles on the Sabbath. You see most of these miracles are purposely done on the Sabbath by design. And Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he'd received his sight, and he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. So he's starting to get an understanding of who Jesus is. The Jews did not believe that he'd been blind and that he'd received his sight until they called the parents of the blind man who'd received his sight. And they asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And the parents said, we know this is our son, but that he was born blind. But, but how he now sees, we do not know, do, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he would be put, they would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. So for a second time, they called the man who'd been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see amazing grace. That's where that comes from. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want, also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, Why, is, this, is, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. 
Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So you can see this growing revelation. Now, even today, this may be, to put emphasis on this miracle, I don't know, maybe that's why we have amblyopia today. We cannot reproduce this today. There's no such thing as a magic birthday, but there is work done years ago about 35, almost really 40 years ago by Halveston and um, Rick Saunders, who's now in Charleston, South Carolina, that looked at, is there, is there a birth date at which you know, amblyopia is really not reversible? Um, and it, it co comes closest to the seventh birthday. In other words, if you're on the phone with somebody and, and you find that a child is injured, somebody that's younger than seven has a statistically much higher likelihood of not recovering their sight in comparison to somebody over seven. And so I'm not a, I'm not a pediatric ophthalmologist, but that's what I understand about the, the, the concept today of, of uh, healing somebody born blind. So they answered him, you were born in utter sin. Again, going back to that Leviticus work where somebody who has an affliction has thought, oh, who sinned, either this man or the sin of their parents. Um, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in, again, the Son of Man? Not just Jesus' favorite title, not just to emphasize his humanity, but also to tie his existence to that very important verse in Daniel 7. Okay, one like a Son of Man coming from the clouds. He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. So he has now saving faith, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. This is a reference to spiritual blindness, an active hardening of the heart, not dissimilar to what happened with Pharaoh and the 10 plagues, okay? Telling Moses, you know, he's gonna wanna let you go, but then I'm gonna harden his heart and I'm gonna have another plague. He's gonna wanna let you go, I'm gonna harden his heart and you're gonna have another plague. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, and again, remember the previous chapter, chapter eight, and then now, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your, gout, your guilt remains. There's accountability there. Remember, the Pharisees, they were the most religious people of the time. They, they knew the number of words in the scripture. They, they counted out the words and found the middle word in the scripture. They could all tell you what the middle word was. They thought those things made them better than other people, better than the tax collector. So again, going back to this, this is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind the Lord lifts up those who bow down. The Lord loves the righteous, Exodus 4.10. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. Either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who has made him you have seen or blind? He said, Not I, the Lord. John 3.16. If we go to a sporting event later today and somebody holds up a sign, Statistically, it's going to be more likely to be John 3.16. One of my favorite words in the verse, though, is for. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay? So why is this word for? Because of John 3.14.16. See, this is, if, if you don't know that what comes before this, you're going to say God is love. Okay? All I have, it's, he died for the world. He's love. But you realize that it's more complex than that. You go back to, you, you go, you go back to Numbers, the, uh, the book of Numbers, where, and as Moses, after, the, after they've been bitten by, the, uh, 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 bitten by the serpents, lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so must the messianic title, Son of Man, be lifted up, and put on a cross, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So that's the link there. That's the link. This is, this is not the, you know, this is, 
it's, it's a lot more complex than God is love. Because the people that were bit by the serpent, they, were, they prayed to Moses, and they said to Moses, tell God we're sorry, we grumbled too much. Take away this affliction, because they were bitten by these, by these serpents, and they died if they didn't go and look. So the ones that did not have faith to go and look at the serpent still died. And so that's where we are in this world today. That's the, this is saying you, you need to have that level of faith. So anyway, I want to connect the dots now to what this means uh, in my practice today. It's a reassurance that God is always on plan A, never plan B. Don't think for a moment that God put Adam and Eve in, in, in the Garden of Eden, Eden, perfect everything, and then, oh, they, what were they thinking when they ate that apple? Now I've got to come up with a plan of redemption. Now that was all, God is always on plan A. The corollary to that is Satan is never on plan A. He never gets everything he wants. Okay, he's a, he's a, uh, he will never get everything that he wants. And, and when patients compliment me on taking care of them, um, I realize that on my best day, I'm functioning as God's middleman. That's nothing more than, is nothing more than you can do to be a conduit of God's grace as you minister to your patients, physically, spiritually, and, and in all other ways. As a, a friend of mine says, I'm in the surgery business, but God is in the healing business. And uh, either he who plants or he who waters is anything. Okay, that's what we do. But it's only God who gives the growth. And that's the, he that's the real healing that goes on, whether it's after surgery or it's, it's, it's after a diagnosis or, or however you interact with your patient. Patients and their families may connect the dots and link their illnesses to guilt and sin. And while illness, death, conflict, and sorrow are all linked to the consequence of sin, in most cases, we're unable to link a specific sin to a specific consequence or illness. Okay, sometimes we can. If, you know, somebody's been smoking for 60 years, they get lung cancer, we make that association, things like that. But we've got to be careful because patients will sometimes, you know, Think that this is a this is a, 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 a they'll, get, they'll have an, a, an unusual guilt about things and conflict, disease, illness, death, sorrow all remind us of sin, the fall of mankind, and our desperate need for the gospel. The human body, health, healing, recovery, these all remind us of the wonderful glory of God. Well, I, I want to show you a picture I took last week. Um, I did doctor it a little bit. I was coming, I was coming out of the, uh, I was coming out of work, and my car was next to this car. This is my car, a little three series uh, 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 BMW. And uh, I, I did doctor it because there's a walkway here, and I moved my car three feet closer. But uh, you know, we work when you work at a university, you're really working at a melting pot, and we're becoming more and more open and liberal, and and uh, and uh, so I. I I want to take this picture. I, I, I've never had a vanity plate. I just, uh, it's the first time I've ever, I think people that have them are strange, uh, but I did get one just, a, just a, uh, uh, about two months ago. Uh, and I put my Berean license plate, which it, it brings about certain uh, conversations, but I moved it closer to this uh, uh, pro-choice uh, bumper uh, uh, license plate that's rampant on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on campus. But again, we're called to be salt and light, but the salt should never stay in the salt shaker. So that's the, that's a key thing that uh, I have to remind myself when I'm on campus. And it's very easy easy to kind of cower down uh, with things. I've already been reprimanded uh, by even the state board for sharing my faith with a patient um, uh, who reported me to the state board. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, though I should be worthy. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, thank you. This was this was my uh, first talk, uh, and I've got a lot more, and I don't know what time it is. <laughs>